So um, he also knows how to do scything and, and many wonderful things. So I'm going to turn it over to David and uh, we'll, we'll get to start looking at his. He's also a great hiker and uh, it's really fun to go on a, on a hike or a trip with him. Um, you not only learn stuff, but you, you just see how beautiful Nova Scotia is. Sometimes I forget. Um, okay, well, thank you much, very much for inviting me. It's, um, I realize it's a big night, especially for people of origin from south of the border, <laughs> even for us too. Um, the top left is uh, the, the photograph is uh, taken a few days ago at Polly's Cove, where uh, originally I think we were, I was supposed to lead a walk out there last June. I was kind of disappointed that didn't happen. I hope somehow or another we'll manage it in 20. 2021, certainly one of my favorite places to go. To go. Yeah, okay. Well, my formal connections with the Roto Society go back basically to this presentation in 2013. <clears throat> but as Bob mentioned, our personal connections go, go back a bit further, especially to Bob. And hi also to uh, Sheila Stevenson and Susan too, because she's here, and Stephen Armstrong and others. Uh, lots of people I think I know around there. Um, well, a very special event for me was the visit of Paniota Calatis uh, in 2014, the, and he's a um, curator at the Denver um, Botanical Gardens. And I was asked to show him the, um, the Purcell's Cove area barrens. And also I took him to Shabakto Head. So there's a couple of photographs from, from that time. And um, of course, as you know, he's domesticated many wild plants for horticultural, horticultural use. And, uh, you know, I read a lot about him and follow him and everything else. And it's really stimulated me to think a lot more about the relationship of horticulture to conservation. So that, that's been very enlightening. <clears throat> I remember two things, especially about his impressions on that day. One was um, of Redora. It was for his first encounter with Redora at the top left there up here, which is, is just, I think, ending flower, which is the most northern of the Eastern North America native azaleas. And in my mind, uh, by far the most beautiful. And he certainly um, was, was very en enthralled with it. And then secondly, was his comment on visiting this area of dwarf jack pine and broom crowberry and everything else on the, um, in, in the barrens behind Purcell's Cove. And what I especially always remembered was his, he made one comment when he saw it, and he said bonsai. And I thought it was a really wonderful description of some of those jack pine barrens where you really get the dwarf trees and the gnarled trees, and 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 it really is like like walking through through a garden. So basically, what I'm going to present you is a kind of a replica of that garden, in a two by four meter area of a garden in the backyard. So. I'm not talking about big sweeping gardens of big, those wonderful big rhododendrons that we're so lucky to have a good habitat for in Nova Scotia and of course all you people working with them. I'm talking about basically the area of one of those rhododendrons, <laughs> but cramming anywhere up to 10 or 15 species into it. And it's my kind of version of the, the bonsai, if you want, of, of his bonsai. Anyway, just to to go back a little bit to some of the things I talked about in that 200, 2013 talk, uh, which, with the, which the title of which was uh, Ericaceous Nova Scotia, and I was just making the point that, that as a province we have a lot of connections to the Ericaceae. Uh, it's a great place for wild ones to grow. It's a, it's, uh, we have lots of people growing rhododendrons and done some very great work down here, of course, as you know. We have wild blueberries, the uh, trailing arbutus, our mayflowers, our provincial flower. Uh, we had Sam Vanderclue, who did all that wonderful, was a global authority on vaccinium. And uh, we've, we've now got a, really quite a lot of um, scientific documentation to work with Jeremy Lundholm and Nick Hill and, and others. It's, it's really, um, even in the last seven years, there's been a lot of, a lot of work done. So there's a lot, a lot of connections we have to the family Ericaceae. And then I, what I really got into there was the molecular phylogeny of the Ericaceae as a family. And of course that's changed everything. And also it, its relation to the 
to the phytogeography of the plants is just fascinating. And uh, one group, for example, that I was really pleased to be bought into the Ericaceae was the Empatraceae, um, the crowberries. And of the seven, seven or eight species of crowberries, we have one, two, three, four, five of them right here around Halifax, right around on the, on the Shabuktal Peninsula. And, um, you know, some really fascinating things. So we have Karima conradii, that's the only secure populations anywhere are in Nova Scotia. And that, that's actually a cross between Serratiola aerocoides from, from the southeastern U.S. and from Karima album from the Azores. Which is really interesting stuff that comes out of that uh, molecular phylogeny. And then um, I talked a little bit about, about some of the habit and the physiological characteristics and so on. And um, the main point about them that relates to what I'm talking about is that the Ericaceae as a family are what, we, what plant ecologists call stress tolerators. They're plants that um, if you put them in a very nutrient rich, super favorable environment, they don't compete well with competitors because they're slow growing, um, but they can tolerate extreme stress. And they typically in open acidic habitats and cold to warm temperate climates, most diverse in the Mediterranean climates in the mountains of Southeast Asia, Malaysia, and South America. And that stress tolerance is, um, is one reason that uh, Nova Scotia is such a favorable habitat. Uh, about 60% of our landscape in Nova Scotia has very, very shallow bedrock, very hard shallow bedrock, and it's quite acidic and nutrient poor. And then there's the exposure to winds and cold and everything else. And that actually makes a very favorable habitat for the, for the Ericaceae and the Shabucto Peninsula, which I consider to be my bioregion um, in particular. And also fire will stimulate some, some groups of them. Uh, also as well in the Shabucto Peninsula, which is the peninsula when you draw a line between the upper part of St. Um, Margaret's Bay and the Bedford Basin, it's, that's the, this is the Shabucto Peninsula down here, it's now got a large percentage of protected areas. So it, it's, it's really a significant um, area. So a few examples, I gave examples of the, um, some of the habitats and the species growing there. I'm just gonna give two, an example of barrens and an example of bog. So these are some, what I call hinterland barrens near the coast uh, on the bluff trail, the top left with the, with the broom crowberry, some huckleberry to be in the fall and then the reindeer lichen. Uh, up here, bearberry and rock tripe lichen. This is what they call dwarf heath over here a little bit inland from the Shabucto ahead. And this is one of my favorite areas. This is up in the hills behind Indian Harbor, up behind the Swiss Air Memor Memorial. Just absolutely spectacular scenery up there. This isn't seawater, these, these are lakes here. And uh, this is what it looks like in the fall. I mean, the last, it's, it's, I think it, they pretty well dropped now, but from about October 20th to perhaps November, well, early November, you get the, this magnificent, you know, after most of the leaves have dropped, these, these, uh, the huckleberry turns fire engine red and it's just absolutely spectacular. And then uh, bogs, the other type. Of course, Nova Scotia has a lot of bogs and fans. A fan is, a, a bog is a, um, an area that, that's only rain fed and it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a flow through it. A fan will have a flow through it of some sort. Well, not necessarily through it. it may may be fed by springs, but then there's then there's a, a stream exiting it, or it may, there may be a flow through it, and then ba basically we have lakeside fans. Um, but uh, uh, bogs and fans accumulate their they have a very high water table, and they accumulate peat. That's the that's the um, key characteristic about them. So I talked a little bit about, finally, about conservation. I've just mentioned protected areas. Uh, natural landscaping would be nice to see a lot more of it. We're, we're beginning to see a little bit of it. Um, 
domestication of our native ericaceae by, by two routes, one a horticultural route, and then also just getting plants from waste areas and putting them in your garden, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. And then I think increasingly important as we move forward climatically is assisted migration. And I think that's where the horticulturalists have a, a, a big, big role to play. And Captain Steele is, of course, was fascinated with, with rhododendron maximum. I've got the map over there on the left. I, I, I don't know if it's still controversial, if it was ever actually here or not. Um, anyway, just to, um, I don't want to go into this a lot of detail, but we're, I'm talking about barrens and bogs. And the main thing is that barrens are upland, nutrient poor, droughty areas. And they tend to be dominated by ericaceous species. So they're same, we also call them heathlands. So ericaceous species are prominent, they're not waterlogged. Whereas bogs are peatlands. Those have the high water table and that's where peat accumulates and they're basically bogs and fens. Now barrens we can divide into, and this is based on some of the research that um, Jeremy Lindham and others have done, partially on that but it's, a, it's useful to distinguish between rock barrens and sand barrens. Now, of course, the sand barrens, so looking down this map here, uh, sand barrens are pretty restricted in Nova Scotia, where these green dots are. Those are the, most of the sand barrens, and about 97% of the sand barrens, I think that's the number, have been converted to other uses, mostly agricultural and residential. And the, the red here are the rock barrens, and they're largely concentrated along the Atlantic coast down here in southwest Nova Scotia and up on northeastern Cape Breton. So we can divide these into highland, inland, and coastal. And the sand barrens also are inland and coastal. And the coastal ones actually occur in sand dune systems. If you poke your head around sand dune systems, sometimes you'll, you'll find the black crowberry and those sorts of things growing. And, that, and that's a coastal sand barren, which is not acidic. It'll actually be a bit on the alkaline side. So the rock barrens are cons consistently acidic. The sand barrens may be more towards neutral to even alkaline. And then there would be some trees in the crevices and in a few areas, but not dominated by trees. That's key to being called barrens. And bushlands, where you have a bit more soil, I, I call the bushes the thing like the huckleberry, uh, sheep laurel, uh, uh, Rodora, all, all those sorts of things. So that's kind of an overview. And then of course the bog has very characteristic plants besides the, uh, the eric ericaceae. Now these um, different vegetation types occur in a kind of mosaic on the landscape. So this is Polly's Cove. And this is in the fall, so the red would be huckleberry red. So that's, these, these are bushes where there's a bit more soil. The trees here are mostly black spruce, and you can see you get little islands of trees here. We have some big, some big bogs over here. Okay, and then on the rocks we have what, what they call dwarf heath. It's just over very shallow, shallow soils. And that's that's a mosaic, and that's a mosaic on a fairly large scale, could be larger scale than that. But then you also have it on a micro scale. So here's where we have on a micro scale and the, the real micro scale is the one at the bottom left here. And within a square meter, you've got wetland plants and you've got dryland plants. You've got broom crowberry um, up here and bearberry and then you've got right next to it because there's a little crevice where some water accumulates. And that, that's because it's on granite, granite's hard. And where it's sloping, it's well drained and it's very droughty, but where there's a basin, it accumulates water. So you can get wetland and dryland plants right next to each other. This is on, on top of Piggy Mountain. And this is a, a jack pine forest that burned in uh, 2009. And it's a very windswept droughty area, but right in the middle of it, there's, there's a neat little wetland area with cranberry and sedges and everything else. Here's some crevices in a rock where, where you've got cinnamon ferns. So, so mosaic is a very key concept. And this goes along with my, my bonsai uh, garden, if you want. My garden is on that sort of scale, not on the larger scale. 
So here's the, um, here's the barons and bog garden. And these things you're looking at are all contained literally within two by four square meter area. So it's not a huge spectacular garden. It's a very small pocket garden in, in a uh, peninsula Halifax typical backyard area. No, perhaps not so typical. But that's the, that's the setting for it. So those are the species that you can see there. there. There's more. So I've got two trees, tamarack and jack pine. Uh, Rodora up here, golden heather in the tray. Labrador tea, wetland. Again, these are wetland and dryland species all within this two by four square meter area, which is actually quite natural. Bog rosemary, broom crowberry, dryland, and, and sheep laurel in this picture. Uh, it, my little collection there includes three rare species, not because I particularly try to collect rare species, I don't, but because some rare species or species that are rare in some places are actually quite common around Halifax. And the three that I've got in, in the garden are inkberry, which is quite common in southwest Nova Scotia, but in Canada, it's only found in, in, in Nova Scotia. And th these are the, um, these colors here are the, uh, by, by, um, a, a, by jurisdiction, are the uh, conservation status. So it shows Quebec all yellow, but I mean, it's only, may only occur down here. And then the, um, the blue colors are secure. So you can see that inkberry is this rare in the rest of Canada because it's not there. Um, rock rose, which occurs on the, on the sand bear, which is rare in Nova Scotia and not very, not very common otherwise. Broom crowberry is rare everywhere except in Nova Scotia. And then golden heather is also, uh, is uh, said to be in peril in Nova Scotia, but right now because of the fire, the Spryfield fire, it's quite abundant around this area. And I have no problem taking a few plants and putting them in my, uh, in my garden right now, even though it's rare. But as I said, I, I don't really set out to collect rare species, but as uh, the Lindholm group had documented, there's a number of rare species in our, in our barrens especially, uh, including mosses and lichens and, and vascular plants and also the insects and bees and all sorts of things. So these are, they're very special environments. Well, so how do I get from, um, from the barrens and the bog to the, to the garden? And it all starts with a goat weed, believe it or not. Um, I'm sure some of you have goat weed around your gardens. This is on the Oaks in South End Halifax, which was an estate that belonged to Stanfield for a long time. And he was a, a very good gardener, apparently. And, it's, and there's still plantings around that he planted back in the 40s, I guess. That are still there because he situated them so well. Nobody takes care of them, but they're still. Some of them are still there. A lot of them have been taken away in recent years, but there's still a number of them there. But anyway, in the in the um, in the woodlands around the oaks, there's goat weed, and it looks actually quite beautiful. And probably somebody brought goat weed deliberately into that habitat, uh, probably in the 1800s, as a ground cover in these these wooded kind of areas. So it's quite beautiful. But as in a lot of Halifax gardens, I have goat weeds on three sides of my garden. With my three neighbors, I have goat weed all along the borderline. And basically, very, very hard to get rid of it. So I came up with a scheme um, which consists of making little garden beds separated by trenches. These trenches get dug out every year and that's one way I try to isolate, stop the goat weed from moving, moving into these raised garden beds. Although I discovered that this, they will move in there by speed. So you, you can never really stop the stuff getting in. But having these trenches, now I'll show you how they're made in a minute, around the garden beds is key to controlling goat weed. And that's kind of what my beds look like. That was in the, the year 2000. So here's what's involved in the trenches <clears throat> is in the fall time, this is in 2006 when I had some assistance from a, from a grandson. 
would, would dig out the trenches that received leaves in 2006, throw the rough compost on top of the garden beds for the fall, the finer stuff would put in barrels to use for uh, seed beds and fertilizer later. This is the coarser stuff. Some of this would go into the, under the fall greens and then add leaves to the trenches and, and take out the goat weed as, as you go along. So it's a method that um, I just devised by fooling around to control goat weed and also to build up the fertility in the garden uh, organically. And, and I, I present this because it's pertinent to understanding what you have to do when you, when you bring ericaceous plants in because they don't like rich environments. And the soils here are now are very, very rich, organically very rich because I've built them up over the years with this. So these are the uh, leaves in the fall of 2020. The Norway maple, which I don't like, but I would dig a trench and it's amazing how much a six foot trench can absorb about five bags of leaves because you stick it in there, and stand on it. And then I take out the goat weed as I go along. You see there's goat weed here, take the rhizomes out, and then fill it with the, with the Norway maple. I to keep it out of sight. And then I collect through the efforts of some neighbors, not too far away. I, just, I collect typically 50 bags of leaves a year. And I like elm and oak because they're dark and they have lots of tannins in them and they make good compost and they look nice as a mulch. So some of them will go into these trenches and some of them will go over here in these bins and, and be used the, the next year. And then in the summertime, I will add, I will add the, um, the leaves, especially the elm leaves to the alleys as a fresh mulch, uh, just to keep it looking nice. And to find that, you know, I can have lots of weeds and everything else in my gardens as long, long as I have nice pathways and it gives it a sense of order and people don't notice all the other things going on in the garden and, and think it looks nice. But, but it's now, especially at this point, because I started doing this in the early 90s. So the garden is really built up with this organic compost. But there's not excessive nutrients. It really uh, it holds on to the nutrients. You know, I do do a few measurements on it to tell. Now, another feature I, I developed to deal with goat weed was that many plants I put in large buckets. Usually I cut the bottom off. And I put them there for one or both of two purposes. One is to keep the goat weed out or to keep the plant in. So this is stinging nettle and that's a bit of both. And I've never had, I've always had a big bucket of stinging nettle like that. And it's never escaped into the garden. And I never have a problem with, with goat weed inside that bucket. And, and the buckets are large enough. Uh, and it'll, it'll go down maybe, that might go down a foot or a foot and a half and then it's open on the bottom. They're large enough um, that they hold lots of water. And so, and also they're very good. If you have to water, they're good because you put the hose in there and it just goes in there for a bit. But again, that's just a feature I developed in the garden using a lot of buckets. And some, most, a lot of plants like it, some don't. But that's kind of the background to the garden. So the, the garden is kind of, has always been kind of a hodgepodge of, uh, of ornamental plants and, and, um, and, and food plants. Um, and includes, anyway, to get an idea from the, the picture that it's, it's a bit of a hodgepodge like that. Um, in regard to native plants, for a long time, I, I didn't make any effort to accumulate native plants. I did, I was interested in wild plants and I liked the wild plants, uh, especially the, the ruderal plants, the wild weedy plants I liked because they I often have attractive flowers like knapweed. I, I love it. It attracts so many insects and it's quite a beautiful plant. Uh, I love wild mustard. I actually grow wild mustard in the garden because it uh, makes nice flowers in the springtime. It self seeds. And then I, I use the leaves as, um, you know, in salads and so on. And then I've experimented with, uh, you notice on those, those uh, raised garden beds are all stabilized by something growing on the sides of them. And uh, one of the things I really like is uh, evening primrose, the little garden variety is, is wonderful for it. There's a lot of different plants. And um, this one down here is a Veronica, a speedwell species. Really beautiful little flower, but 
and I bought it in my garden, started using it, and I soon regretted it because it got into my lawn and almost took over everything else. And then I, I don't have it anymore, but I haven't made too many mistakes like that. But I really, I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't really looking for native species. I did, I did introduce Iris Versicolor in 1977. I've been in the house since 1975, and it's still in the same place. A uh, very robust plant, and it's still producing nice flowers like that. And I've put in stuff like goldenrod, so on, sort of on spur of the moment. Those are, those are all those plants you see are plants that do well on that rich soil environment. So they're, they're kind of welcome there. Then uh, native plants themselves really started to think more about native plants. For my first person to stimulate me to do that was Nick Hill, probably many, many of you know. Nick, Nick and I have done many projects together, including Nick's PhD <laughs> thesis. But anyway, Nick runs an operation called Fern Hill, and for a while he was propagating ferns uh, just to take the market and so on. And Nick said, I had this dark kind of shaded alley beside the house. It was all full of hostas. and said, oh, Dave, take out the hostas and put in ferns. And he gave me these, this lovely interrupted fern. And uh, I collected some others, and, I, and that's now my fern alley. And again, those ferns, uh, if you grow them in the right light and moisture, they, they, do, they do fine in rich soil. So they're, they're quite happy with my, my leaf compost. And they're, um, I do take the goat weed out around them, but they're, they're very competitive with goat weed. And I have, I think, maybe eight or 10 species of native ferns. In, mostly in the shaded areas around the house. And then I put my, my hostas out on the verge. I put my crap plants out on the verge because I never know how long the verge is gonna last. Um, and then also Bill Friedman, the late Bill Friedman and Mike McDonald who has worked closely with Bill. Bill probably, you know, was a very prominent plant ecologist conservationist who died prematurely in 2015, so did Mike. And Bill had a street front garden with probably 75 or 80 species of na native plants in it. And Bill would just bug me all the time. He says, I'm not interested in your ornamentals. I'm not interested in your food crops. I want to see the native species. So it just kind of bugged me a bit. And then um, I thought, well, I really should start to do this. And then I, I started to do more natural history around um, Halifax and I got involved in studying the backlands and then we had the Spryfield fire. And after the Spryfield fire, you know, everything burned down, some really interesting things happened. And I collected a couple of, couple of plants from that. And one of them was Rhodora, which came up in these single shoots. So the fire was in 2009 and it came up as these single shoots like that. Well, I dug one out with a part of a root system and took it to my garden. And then also there were all kinds of seedlings of jack pine. So I took some of those and took them to my garden and kept them in pots for a while. But then the thing that really stimulated me to get more serious about it was a trip to the Irving Botanical Gardens plant sale in 2011. I, I visited it once, but then I went to the plant sale in 2011 and they had all kinds of seedlings of, of native plants that they had raised from seed from plants collected on their property. And of course they have their, their theme gardens. I'm sure you've all seen them. And that started me thinking me, me thinking about theme gardens. And so I, I purchased a bunch of these plants and these are the ones I purchased that year. These for top six are all plants that, that do well in calcareous lands. And these two are ones that are more in the bog and barren area. So that's what I, came out of there with in 2011, and that was the start of some of my gardening. And I thought, well, I've, I've got to make a gypsum garden, and I've got to make a Belgian barren garden to accommodate these things, just like Irving Botanical Gardens does. So that's what I set out to do. So for my gypsum garden, I dug a hole about a foot and a half deep like that, and I put a tarp in it um, to restrict drainage. It's not not trying to be watertight, it's just a restrict drainage, so it's kind of swampy. And then I put those lovely plants from the Irving Botanical, and, and, and I put, and put the soil back in, which is already my leaf compost soil. I put that back in, added a lot of granular gypsum to it, 
uh, to, to add the calcium and then grew the herbing plants and they just did absolutely wonderfully. That's what they looked like. So we have here the um, oh, Calthopalustris, I can't remember the common name of it, marsh, marsh marigold, I think. The Canada anemone grows like a weed. It actually grows out into my lawn and I let it grow out in the lawn and then I mow it and it'll come back the next year. And then and, and swamp milkweed, lobelia, cut leaf cone flower. I had turtle head and a few other things. And so again, those, those plants all do well in a rich environment with some calcium added to them. And then some restricted drainage to, to encourage it to hold water a little bit was the key there. And that was quite, quite predictable. But then, and I was accumulating these plants from the bogs and barrens, but trying to figure out how, what I'm gonna do with them. And because they need these more acidic conditions, they, they need nutrient poor conditions, not nutrient rich conditions. I was keeping them in pots and trays and so on until I could figure out uh, what, what to do with them. So, so these are some of the ones I had in pot. There's the jack pine seedling down there. Uh, sheep laurel was actually I, I got from a plant I just pulled out of the ground in the in the woods in South End Halifax. A beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful plant. Tamarack I can't remember where I got from. I think bayberry I got from Nick, and the bearberry came from um, came from um, the Irving Gardens. Cinnamon fern. I don't. I, I think I got cinnamon fern just from native habitat. But they sat on these buckets and things. And my problem was I wanted to put them next to the, in another garden next to the gypsum garden along the fence. But when I got into it, I discovered that two things. I had quite a bit of protruding bedrock and I had to use a pickaxe to dig holes in it. And it also had a lot of coal ash because in the old days when they used coal, they threw the ash in the backyard. And of course the coal ash is alkaline. So I had a problem. <laughs> I was gonna get these darn plants in there. Um, so they, again, they sat there like that for a year, and then I started to work on it the next year. And what I did was, I put I put them in larger containers, some with the bottoms on but holes in to restrict drainage, some not, some in shallow containers. And all of them I put in a mixture of three parts of peat and one part of my rich garden soil to make it make it acidic. And then I managed to pickaxe holes in the soil, get enough of the rocks and so on to insert these into this, because I, I basically had nowhere else to grow them. Because I needed a relatively sunny location for them because the bogs and barrens are mostly well exposed. Um, so these are some of the plants that I had in, uh, in 2012, in August 21st, 2012, in my little two by four area. And this is what it looked like. This is what it looked like from a side view in August 9th, 2012. So my gypsum garden over here, and my bog and barren garden, my little mini garden over here. And then this is May, the next year in the spring, May 22nd, 2013, taken from my porch here. So it gives you an idea. It's not a big garden. And um, that's 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 what it's that's how it started, and I can tell you that these two gardens have been the, the easiest to maintain in my in my whole garden. They're the ones that do the best, and absolutely the bog and barren garden is the least trouble and looks the best most of the time. I have the least trouble with goat weed, um, even if I don't water it regularly. They're stress tolerators and they don't seem to mind, and they just seem to thrive and thrive in these bucket systems that I have on the corner of the garden. So here it is, I think, yeah, this is actually this fall. So look how that tamarack has grown up there. It's now about 25 feet high. The jack pine, I actually chopped it off because it was getting too tall quite a long time ago. Actually the tamarack, it had grown up and a tree on the other side of the property fell down and broke it off. Broke it off about down here and then it grew up as three uh, branches grew up from that. It was very, very beautiful. People come and they thought it was some kind of exotic uh, horticultural specialty. Um, and then finally this summer I decided, well, it needs to go back to one. And so there it is. 
and it's high enough that the birds actually land here and I have, I have a bird house on the veranda over here. Um, and that's the garden and it, it's a very stable garden and it always, always looks nice. Now I have one other theme garden that I've been developing, which is the woodland in front of the tall fence in the back of the property. So these are just some of the things I've got there. Uh, one of my prizes there is a witch hazel. That witch hazel I think I brought in from a small shrub around 2012. And of course it's flowering right now. And I have a striped maple here. And it, there was a big tree here. My idea, my idea was that these would be sub canopy trees in here, but that tree fell down. It's the one that broke the tamarack. And so now, they, now the striped maple is, shoot, is, is shooting up. I also have a, I also have a mountain maple and shad bush and, and mountain ash in there. And one point is that these, I don't have to worry about the goat weed. So they have goat weed around the base, but it doesn't bother them. They're competitive. I just cut it back. So that's not a problem there. So that, that's my, so I have basically four kinds of theme native gardens I've been developing. And I, I'm going to, um, the next summer, try and develop some of the forest floor species back there. So now I've got it kind of established. So to get back to the um, bog and barren garden, I sent out this little table and I've divided the species up by sunlight, basically full sun, uh, shady or shade tolerant and more shade only mountain laurel and that, that comes from uh, Massachusetts. This really, really likes a lot of shade. And then in this direction is uh, going from wet to dry. And these are the species I, I've have, have or had or a couple of them I've moved out uh, that I've maintained for some time in the, my, my bog and barren garden. And as I said, I use a standard soil mix here. So these ones, the wet ones are in containers with restricted drainage or no drainage or in a, in a low spot. If I have one that I can put lots of peat into. The drier plants are either open bottom containers or none depending on what I'm able to get there. And then droughty ones over, are either on thin soil over bedrock or they're, they're in, uh, it can just be on the surface or they're in shallow drained trays. And that's the, um, that's how I manage those species. So this, this shows you some of the, um, uh, the trays and containers and so on. So the, the jack pine is in a 15 inch wide uh, pot, large pot. It's open in the bottom. Tamarack's only 12 inches wide, if you can believe it. And it, look how tall it grows up here. Here's the birdhouse. I call this the most beautiful birdhouse in the world. It was built from uh, driftwood in the Bay of Fundy by my cousin. And the birds land here and go over there. And that, that tree has shot up there in the last three or four years. And it's, it's, in a, it's only in a 12 inch wide bucket and seems to do fine. My, uh, my prize is my Rodora, and that's in a clay container that was roughly 12 by 16 inches deep. And I pushed, you know, managed to dig a hole in the soil and again filled with that, with that mix. A little, I restricted the drainage slightly to, to keep it wet. The, this one, the um, lamb kill or, or uh, sheep laurel is, is in a 14 inch open bottom bucket. An absolutely magnificent plant. You know, it's a scourge of foresters in Nova Scotia, but my, what, what an absolutely beautiful plant that, that flowers around early July, I think late June. On the ground here is, is uh, bearberry in a tray, uh, golden heather. And that's it, it's a very shallow tray. I, I take my um, garden fork and punch holes on the bottom so it drains quickly. And then down on the bottom, I have some, some cinnamon fern just in the ground. But then the, my real prize, and I, I think Paniotti would like this, is really my Rodora. I absolutely love this plant. Uh, it's such a beautiful plant. And on the left here shows you, it, it, this is up in the, in the Mersey Chalets, I think. This is, um, and that, those are flowers, of course, are all from my earth. But then the leaves are also, they, 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 it can go through this pastel pink stage in the fall and just be absolutely magnificent. And then these, oh, this is, these are from the fire barons. And all of these pictures are in my garden. So I can enjoy 
all the aspects of this magnificent plant. And this is the plant in 2016 that started off from one shoot and produced all of those flowers. And, and the buds in the spring are so beautiful. Just an absolutely magnificent plant. And, and seems to thrive. I just absolutely have no problem with it. And it's flowered, I think, the first time in 2013. It's flowered every year since. Um, this year it was getting, I had far fewer flowers and it was getting kind of woody and stuff. And I thought, oh boy, I don't like the looks of this. And, and I thought, well, I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna take a chance. And after it flowered, I trimmed it back. And I really didn't know what would happen. And this is what happened on the left. It just did absolutely fine. And my bog rosemary was also starting to look kind of ratty. I did the same thing and it responded the same way, it came back. And uh, probably you people know that well, but to me, I, I just didn't know they would take, take that kind of cutting back, but that absolutely was what they did. So I, I don't know if there will be a lag of a year before they flower again, but they seem to be doing absolutely well. So I'm just really happy with those plants. Okay, well, that's kind of the story about the garden. Um, a little bit about conservation and where we can get plants. Our, our barrens are still at risk in Nova Scotia. You know, we've, we've already chewed up most of the sand barrens and we're still at work on the rock barrens. And of course, there's this controversy now about the, uh, the, um, the Owl's Head Golf Course. Did you, huge obscenity go into those wonderful lands. This is in the top of Ocean View Drive. Just a lovely sight to going in there. I'd been there last year. I went there recently. I was absolutely shocked to find that, that somebody had put a driveway right over this little wetland, chopped all this stuff down and put a new property in there. And apparently it's all legal. And then this is the the, the extension of Bears Lake all on what they called the Whopper Dopper. It was an area the mountain bikers loved and that was all bar beautiful barrens up there. And these are some of the plants. The, these are ones, some that were around the first year they, they bulldozed it. You can see the Rhodora down here. This I went there recently and found some areas with broom crowberry and lichens and so on. And of course I took some and there's my tray I took from directly from that just this late this summer with broom crowberry and, and some reindeer lichens and so on. This is Governor Brook over here where they completely pulverized a barren to, to make housing developments. So that's what we're dealing with. Now I don't really have any illusions that my little four by six garden is going to conserve very much of that. Obviously that's not the answer, but, but, but at least I think that if we're gonna beat these areas up, we should make them accessible to the public. We should advertise them and make them accessible to the public for a period to go in and remove native plants. I can't see why any downside to doing that. And that would at least encourage people to take an interest in these areas and maybe stop them being destroyed so quickly. Because they're just such phenomenally beautiful areas. So top left, what could be a nicer setting in the Swiss Air Memorial than just the native landscaping? At the top right is some of the barrens that they didn't pulverize for Governor's Brook. And it's just the most lovely area to walk and the mountain bikers love it. And really they don't, you know, they take out the lichens and some of the broom crowberry on there, but it really don't, doesn't damage anything else. So really good for recreation. And then down here, here is the Bears Lake extension. They took the barrens and they just pulverized it. And I think, mine heavens, couldn't they have left some alleys of these lovely barrens for recreation and just for some peace and quiet and enjoyment and for conservation? Like this little bit of Polly's Cove on October 28, 2020. And hopefully I'll get there with the Rhododendron Society in 2021 or sometime uh, in the future. Uh, one final thought, and that is about assisted migration, because as our climate changes, you know, we have all these wonderful rhododendrons and, and azaleas and er, other ericaceous species to the south of us, just waiting to get to Nova Scotia. This is one, um, I have relatives in Worcester, Massachusetts, and went in an oak woods there, and just, just beside myself to find 
uh, call me a ladder of uh, ladder floor of the mountain laurel leaf. And why I would love to see that in our forests in Nova Scotia. And I guess what I'm saying is, and I mean, you already know that, that that's where I see the horticultural societies are already dealing with these plants and moving them around. I, I think, you know, that could be a really helpful, helpful to us in terms of adapting to climate warming and, and bringing some of these lovely plants north for use in Nova Scotia. Um, so one reason I'm very enthusiastic about the, the Roto Society. And I just close with a few images. The fire barons on Piggy Mountain, and that's Jeffrey Grantham there painting. He's a backlands painter. It's pretty well all he paints. And those are fire barons that burned in 2009. Here's a fire barons that haven't burned in over 50 years. And what a lovely, what a lovely, lovely setting. This is part of the Shaw Wilderness now area, fortunately uh, conserved. And then finally, the Polly's Cove, Polly's Cove barons just very recently, where I hope we can, we can all get, get back to sometime next year. And I think that's the end. I, I'm going to put um, some links and references up on this web location. I just didn't quite get them finished today. So that's that's my um, that's my talk. So I guess whatever we do now. <laughs> Here we go. Well, we say thank you first of all, David. It's a wonderful talk, and uh, yeah, we need to conserve more of our beautiful province. And I want to point out to everyone that this that website you were just pointing out is, yeah. I think, the best website in Nova Scotia if you want to learn about native, what's going on natively. And when we have speakers from, from away come, I almost always send them that website to say. Okay, he, mean, he means the first part of it, the verse of color. Verse of color, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's my, my web space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because well, thank you. Thank you, Bob. I, that's a real compliment. Well, it was super interesting and lots of, and again, lots of good pictures and a wide, wide range of links to other conservation and nature groups. So, you know, most of our speakers are interested in what's, what's your natural environment like anyway? And, you know, what's going on there? I say, here's the answer. Just send the link. Well, heavens, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs>